Hello and welcome to yet another episode of Top Tens. I'm your interim host, Carl Smallwood. That's Carl with a K and Smallwood with a small and a wood. And today we're talking about 10 marketing terms that are completely meaningless. And as with all the videos here at Top Tens, this one is based on a script submitted to us by a member of our writing team. That member today being Ian Forty. Follow him on the social media links you can find below. Alongside all those other little bells and whistles, us YouTubers ask you to press like the like button, the comment button for anything we've missed or feedback and suggestions and the subscribe button which I don't like asking people to press at the start of a video but analytics do show the earlier I ask people to do it the more likely it is to happen because people are easily swayed by uh, the words of someone talking online as we're about to find out. So it's been said that marketing is more about selling an idea rather than a physical product. There's an early episode of Mad Men which deals with this, in which Don Draper comes up with a new way to sell cigarettes by simply saying that tobacco is toasted, even though every brand has toasted tobacco. It doesn't really matter what you're trying to sell, just use words that make it sound enticing. You don't even technically need to lie, just say things that people want to hear, even if that means saying things that literally don't mean anything. A bit of advice, that also applies to dating. But in regards to marketing, why not consider number 10? Corinthian leather is just leather. Is there anything like the smell of a new car? It's hard to explain what it even is. Maybe it's the paint, maybe the deodorizers and cleaners used in production, and possibly even that rich Corinthian leather. Mmm, can you, can you can feel it, right? That The soft, supple, luxuriousness. Corinthian leather, it's got to be the top of the line upholstery, right? Like your car. Just, it feels so nice to slip into a car filled with Corinthian leather. And why shouldn't it be? It's from Corinth, right? The city in ancient Greece that was sacked by the Romans that currently has a population of under 40,000. They probably know a lot about leather, right? In reality, Corinthian leather doesn't have anything to do with Corinth because Corinthian leather isn't a thing. It was literally made up by ad execs for one man because it sounded cool when he said it. That man being Ricardo Monteblan. And the story goes that Monteblan was doing the play Don Juan when he got to Detroit and Chrysler and his ad agency saw him perform. The executives loved Monteblan and wanted him to promote the Cordoba, which sounded kind of Spanish and fit Monteblan's sexy Latin mystique. So where does Corinthian leather come into this? Well, those same ad executives would later sheepishly admit when they were asked, what is Corinthian leather? Uh, it doesn't mean anything. It was just the coolest word they could think of Monteplan to say in his accent. It's available even in soft Corinthian leather. It just, it sounded awesome and it exuded the idea of class, even though the leather they used was just the cheap stock stuff they used in all their other cars. But people thought it was fancy and just them thinking it was fancy made them pay just a little bit more for it. And that's called marketing. Number nine, there's no such thing as sushi grade fish. So about 5 million Americans eat sushi at least once a month, according to various reports. And it's safe to say it's probably the most popular Japanese cuisine in North America. Some people love it enough to try their hand at doing it themselves, even though it can take years or decades to master the art of sushi in Japan. One thing people concern themselves with when it comes to making sushi is the quality of the fish. You need sushi grade fish to make sushi, right? It's right there in the name and you can find sushi grade fish for sale at markets, but what they rarely tell you is that sushi grade fish doesn't really mean anything. And this annoyingly is rather complicated when trying to understand because in America, the FDA does have guidelines for fish if it's been served raw. Specifically, the FDA's Parasite Destroy guarantee says that in order to serve a raw product it must be first and I quote frozen and stored at a temperature of minus 20 degrees Celsius minus 4 degrees Fahrenheit or below for a minimum of 168 hours or seven days that will ensure you're at minimum risk for parasites in the fish but is that sushi grade well no. So there's no regulation in North America for the actual term sushi grade. It may be used by vendors who meet that FDA standard, but the FDA doesn't govern the use of that label. So anyone can say that any fish at all is sushi grade for no real reason at all. Sushi grade was used as a marketing term in the early 2000s to convince restaurants to expand beyond tuna when trying to sell raw fish on their menus. And it was a nice term that sounded official and convinced them to expand their horizons and serve different kinds of fish. But ultimately it has no real meaning it's just it just sounds like it does which is kind of the theme of today's video number eight super fruit is just a vague marketing terms everyone selling a product wants to sell you the next big thing and a buzz term that showed up in the last few years was 
superfood. And this has been narrowed down in some circles to super fruit and things like pomegranates, goji berries, and even blueberries have been called super fruits at one point or another, most because they contain either antioxidants or whatever other nutrients someone is trying to push as a miracle cure. In reality, a super fruit is a fruit. It might be a good fruit and it's great if you love it and want to eat it, but it's no better than other fruits. That's kind of the rub with a word like super. It doesn't really have a lot of objective meanings and as a result can be used in marketing with impunity. Unity. And that isn't to say there's not been any crackdowns on it, because in 2007, the European Union banned the label superfood unless manufacturers could conclusively prove evidence of how the item was good or better for your health than a similar product. So, yeah. Speaking of all things being the same, all salt is sea salt, which is very close to being a tongue twister. Once upon a time, if you went to the store to buy some salt, you'd find boxes of iodized salt and some shakers, maybe some coarse salt, some kosher salt. Now when you go there, you'll find grey salt, pink salt, Atlantic sea salt, Celtic salt, black salt, and probably a few dozen more that we couldn't find while researching. And sea salt is big, especially in marketing of other products. Sea salt chips, for instance, or pretzels coated with coarse sea salt. You know it's good, it came from the sea, except in a very literal way, all salt is sea salt. So even if the fancy salt you're buying came from an ocean that dried up hundreds or thousands of years ago, it still came from the sea and more importantly is chemically identical to all the other salt you can buy. It might just have a handful of other random non-salt minerals included in it in trace amounts that tweak the colour, hence grey, pink, black salt for example. Modern day marketing uses terms like sea salt to make it seem different from regular salt and therefore of a higher quality or more nutritious, but it's all the same stuff in the end. Speaking of which, number six, Angus is just a breed of cattle and doesn't imply any real quality. People take their beef very seriously and any restaurant that is going to entice you to buy a steak or a burger isn't just going to have beef on the menu. They're going to have to try and seduce you with tales of just how great that beef is. It's going to be USDA prime beef and maybe, if you're not really fancy, it'll be certified Angus beef. That has to be good, right? It's certified. It earned a certificate. So what makes beef certified Angus? Well, it has to come from an Angus cow. Makes sense, like a Holstein or a Guernsey. Angus is a breed of cow there, the black ones, and to qualify as Angus specifically, a cow must be mostly black. Then to be certified Angus beef, the meat has to have a specific amount of marbling and fat, muscle thickness, and so on and so forth. Now, in terms of taste, you probably won't notice any difference between Angus beef and any other beef of the same quality because it's beef. It has the same fat content. It's going to taste pretty much the same. The Angus label, which is usually used just to make beef seem of a higher quality, when it probably isn't, um, isn't any tastier or better than normal beef, it's purely marketing. The big difference comes down to the Angus versus certified Angus. So again, it's one of those things where there's kind of a kernel of truth to this. There's some wiggle room that marketing is actually taking advantage of. So the certified meat is at least inspected to ensure the highest quality in terms of marbling, which does affect flavor. Again, if you've had beef from a different breed that had the same thickness, marbling, and fat content, it will taste the same. It's just that certified Angus, like it is the, that, that, all that stuff's insured. And this is where marketing execs can like find that wiggle room and sneak in because if someone's selling Angus beef that doesn't claim to be certified, then it can be any quality of Angus. And this is what fast food companies do with their Angus burgers. And you end up paying more for beef that is of no better quality than just normal beef that you'd find on the menu like five, 10 years ago. Number five, portobello, crimini, and button mushrooms are all the same mushroom. So not everybody enjoys mushrooms, but plenty of people do, and the mushroom industry is worth $50 billion. Matsuka mushrooms can cost as much as $2,000 per pound, so it's easy to see where all that cash is coming from. Marketing plays a big part in selling mushrooms, and nowhere is that more apparent than in the world of portobello mushrooms. For those of us who can't shell out a few grand for a fancy-ass mushroom or a truffle, the portobello is a more accessible, fancy mushroom. You'll see them on menus when a restaurant wants to elevate a dish above just boring old regular mushrooms, or at least trick you into thinking that the mushroom is fancy. It is just a big fungus after all. In reality, there's no such thing as a portobello mushroom. Obviously, it is a mushroom, but it's no different from those little white button mushrooms that you'll see on the shelf of every grocery store in America. And that's because they're exactly the same mushroom, just at different stages of their lifestyle. So those little white button mushrooms will turn brown as they age. And at a certain point, they'll be marketed as criminy mushrooms, probably right next to their pale younger selves on the shelves. But when they grow big enough and they get upgraded to portobello, 
All three mushrooms are the same fungus, just as I mentioned, different stages of their lifespan. Marketing just makes it seem like you're getting something fancier or of higher quality, but you've just waited a bit longer to eat your mushroom. And I hate mushrooms. And the only thing is, I love raw mushrooms. I love the flavor profile of mushrooms, the umami flavor. That's like the secret fifth flavor, like sweet, salty, um, spicy. It's like it's umami, like that, that earthy, brothy taste. But then just when they're cooked, they just taste like rubber. And I, I, you know, I love my mum, but I, I still think it's because, you know, my mum would just put mushrooms into things like um, uh, spaghetti bolognese and would just leave the mushrooms in there for, like, the entire time the thing was cooking and they tasted like bullets. It's like... And I'll tell you, nothing will put you off a type of food quicker than having to sit at the dinner table for an hour and a half chewing on a mushroom. But speaking of things that make you cry, number four, no tears shampoo for kids doesn't have any specific meaning. You ever open your eyes in the shower with a head full of shampoo and instantly regret it as the lava oozes into your eyes and burns into your skull? Good thing they invented a tear-free shampoo, right? So you can lather your eyes until the cows come home. Not the Angus cows, of course. They're too busy being turned into burgers. But except that that's not really how it works. And the concept of no tears shampoo was more a marketing term than any practical change to the formula of shampoo. So there was never actually a standard formula to govern what no tears means between brands of shampoo. And in fact, until 2013, Johnson & Johnson used to include formaldehyde in their no tears baby shampoo, which you probably don't need a degree in chemistry to know was a bad thing to put into your eyes or near the eyes of newborn babies. More confusing was that for some years there was a debate about whether no tears meant tears as in the liquid that comes from your eyes or tears as in the rips and breaks in your hair. There were commercials that made this clear, like the formula was a detangler so that when you comb your hair it wouldn't tear your skull and cause you to cry, but again that just confused the matter. Is that referring to tears in your hair or the tears that would come from your eye from the tears in your hair or is it both? And I know like online when you say no tears shampoo you always get that one person, there's probably one in the comments right now, who didn't listen this far and said, well it's not no tears, it's no tears. That's the thing, we don't know what it is and the shampoo makers don't seem to know themselves. And Johnson & Johnson post formaldehyde years said their formula meant no tears as in no crying if shampoo gets into your eyes because their formula is made of larger molecule designed to be less high to the skin. All of this means the marketing term no tears meant very little to most people since it was so widely open to interpretation and larger molecules are still going to get into your eyes unless the molecules are the size of an egg. Which brings us to number three. Cage free and free range might not mean what you think. Once upon a time you go to a store to buy egg. Now you can pick up omega-3 eggs, organic eggs, cage-free eggs, free-range eggs and a few dozen others. Some of those things might mean something and others probably don't mean what you think. For example, cage-free means that yes, the hen that laid them wasn't in a cage when it did, but it doesn't mean that the hen was outside either. These hens are kept in rooms where they can roam and have unlimited access to food and water. And just because the hens can roam around a little bit and have access to food and water doesn't mean they're necessarily in better conditions than hens that are caged because they may not even have access to things like ventilation or even natural sunlight. However, it's the term free range that's more insidious still because free range sounds like the hens have the ability to wander around. But in reality, it means that they can theoretically wander free. The place they're kept in must have a door to the outside, sure, but there is literally no rule that says a farmer has to open it or that the access they have to outside is anything beyond a small cage. And for anyone out there like myself who wants the chickens to at least have a decent time of it, look for the certified humane label if you want more assurance that your chickens had access to a space outside. Now, another label is farm fresh, which also has no real meaning at all. Chickens are all raised on farms, so it's just filler to say this. The farm could be in the fiery pits of hell and the eggs would still be farm fresh. Likewise, the word natural has no meaning because an egg, by definition, is natural. It is an egg. I'm gonna hold this. I like holding eggs. I don't know why. I used to work in the kitchens and just eggs are very satisfying to hold. I don't know why. Number two, saltwater taffy and regular taffy are the same thing. Would you rather have taffy or saltwater taffy, assuming you're a taffy person at all? What the hell's taffy? You call it taffy? We have toffee. Or like, okay, 
So there's no reason to stress any longer if you are a saltwater taffy or a regular taffy person because there's no difference between the two. Saltwater taffy is just a thing to make it sound better. It's not even made from salt water. So according to legend, a taffy shop in Atlantic City was flooded one day when Poseidon got pissed. A customer wanted to buy some taffy and the owner joked that all he had was saltwater taffy thanks to the flood, but he sold what he had and the customer liked it and boom, a new name was created. Or so the story goes. Speaking of just inventing a new name, number one, the term teenager was invented in the 1940s. So everyone knows what a teenager is. It's obvious, right? But that's only obvious to us in the present. If you ask someone in the 1930s what a teenager was, you'd met with arched eyebrows at best. That's because the concept of teenagers themselves was invented as a marketing angle in the 1940s. So teenage became a recognised phase of life, that awkward spot between childhood and adulthood, as society moved away from its agrarian roots to city living and manufacturing. To prevent kids from all being chimney sweeps or coal miners, mandatory schooling was created and a clear new type of human emerged, the teenager. A little rebellious, a little better educated and unique in their wants and needs. So marketers across the world must have been chomping at the bit and rejoiced at this totally new and cross-cultural customer base they had created to sell things to. And even to this day, the teenager market stands among the biggest forces in pop culture and marketing as everybody wants their thing to be the next big thing for teens. So I hope everybody out there found this video to be educational, entertaining and informative. I certainly found the script to be all three of those things and if you agree, go let Ian Forty, the original author, know on social media links you can find below. I am also on social media, you can find those below if you like. I've got my own channel, Fact Theme with Cal Smallwood and Wookie Weekends, which have an altogether more casual, eggless tone and yeah. If you like the video, leave a like. Anything you'd like to say about it, any feedback, suggestions, like uh, stuff we may have missed, stuff to cover in the future, let us know in the comments down below. And as always, subscribe for more like this. Cheers. <laughs>